Hey, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the session. I'm Romy Datta. I'm a product manager in the Amazon SageMaker organization. And we have a lively session for you today about how you can store features across, fe uh, across your organization and reuse them with Amazon SageMaker Feature Store. Uh, joining me in this talk uh, would be my colleague and friend, Mark Roy, who's a principal ML specialist, solution architect at AWS. And Sergey Filipchuk, who is a principal engineer at Zalando. <clears throat> We're going to learn about feature engineering and some of its challenges. We're going to learn about Amazon SageMaker Feature Store. I'll provide an introduction. Mark will provide a deep dive and demo. And then Sergey will come up out here and talk about how Feature Store is being used in Zalando to speed up their ML operations and in their business use cases. To understand feature engineering and feature store, let us look at a very basic flow outlining the machine learning end-to-end -end flow. It starts with a raw data, which will be in your data warehouse or an object store like S3. You would take that data, do some wrangling, do the transformation on the data to create features which are usable for machine learning, train a machine learning model. Once that model is trained, you would that deploy that model to an inference endpoint to generate predictions, and you would ideally use the same set of features that you use to train the model to generate inference, or at least a subset or similar set thereof. In effect, that becomes the data plane of your end-to-end -end ML operations. But what is the challenge out there? What are some of the challenges? One of the biggest challenges of feature engineering is that it's a very resource-intensive and time-consuming task. Data preparation, as per a Forbes report in 2016, was stated that it consumes anywhere between 65 to 80% of a data scientist's time in their ML journey. A lot of it is because our raw data is inherently dirty for the purpose of machine learning. You take the raw data, and some of the aspects that you would have to fix is missing data, outliers, so on and so forth. This problem is accentuated further because of the lack of standardized tools. There are a lot of tools which data scientists have to learn to do their data preparation and processing. And that's a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting to uh, learn so many different tools and have a ramp curve on that. Now, this becomes even worse in large, medium to large size organizations where you might have different parts of the organization reinventing the wheel so as so to say they would be rebuilding the feature engineering pipelines for the same set of features someone else in their organization or company would have already built. And that is actually more of a symptom. The real reason usually is no way, they do not have a way to share or discover features built by other organization, an efficient way, rather, to share and discover features built by others in the organization. And another challenge in feature engineering, which, machine, uh, which data scientists and machine learning engineers come up against often, is troubleshooting a, the skew between training and inference. A lot of that uh, occurs because of different sets of features being served for training, uh, being served for inference, versus those, those used for training. So let us look at this challenge in a real world example. So let us think of a financial service institution. They would have multiple organizations in there, a division which, or organization which does checking account services, another one which does credit card services. They would probably have a centralized security team. They would have uh, an organization for other transaction services like loans, et cetera. 
Now, let's say if each of these organizations did not have a centralized feature store, they would probably do uh, the repeat, do the task of repeating the feature engineering pipeline for building some common features. A common one we have heard about is creditworthiness. Another is fraud score. Now, not only is this actually uh, you know, duplicating a lot of work which is already pretty time consuming and resource intensive, but there's another challenge out here. That challenge is that often these features need to be standardized across an organization. Things like credit worthiness or fraud score for an individual ideally should not be calculated in different ways within a bank. It should have be a standardized way to do that. Now, with SageMaker Feature Store, you would actually generate these features exactly once. So going back to the same financial service institution, each of these organizations, like checking account services or credit card services, would have specific features for their customers before they, which they want to use for their machine learning predictions. Before they go about building such features, they can go to a centralized feature store, search for any such features, and reuse any of those features that are available. They would have information on uh, SageMaker Feature Store about uh, the, who built that feature, how it was built, et cetera. Other information can be placed in that uh, as sort of associated information with the feature store. So someone like a centralized security organization might be the one who determines the fraud score for all customers across that bank. Well, the checking account service or credit card services divisions would come in out here, come to the centralized feature store, SageMaker feature store, search for fraud score feature, and they might even find two or three different fraud scores in case someone had redundantly built one, but they would want to use the right one, which is the one built by the centralized security team. And that way, they avoid duplication of the feature engineering pipeline, duplication of the tiresome and uh, rather the time intensive and resource intensive work, as well as ensure standardization of features for machine learning across the organization. So we talked about a financial service institution and you know, using for fraud scores and et cetera. What else is SageMaker Feature Store being used for? We have uh, a large e-tailer using it for credit card fraud detection in real time. We have another large financial service institution which is provide, improving its customer experience online by suggesting next best action. And we also have a transportation company which enhances its customers' check-in experience by providing pers uh, personalized check-in experience for them. We are going to hear some of these use cases today, later, uh, from uh, live from a customer, uh, Zalando, when they talk about their usage of SageMaker Feature Store. You're going to learn about a lot of the capabilities today in SageMaker Feature Store, how you can do high throughput writes for ingesting features from any streaming pipeline like Kinesis or Kafka, as well as how you can do batch ingestion of pipeline uh, features from your existing Spark-based uh, feature engineering pipelines. You can learn about, you learn about how we store metadata for features or how you can store metadata for features, tags, uh, associate tags with features, as well as uh, you know, use these tags and metadata to search for individual features and reuse them. You learn about how we catalog the data which you store in the feature store for faster uh, query and creating data sets. You learn about the concept of feature group and how you can have a feature group as an online feature group or as an offline feature group. The online feature group is backed by DynamoDB, the offline based on S3. You'll also learn how 
by virtue of its design, SageMaker Feature Store ensures consistency between training and inference, the features used in training and inference, thus minimizing the skew between training and inference. You will learn about the security and access control mechanisms used in SageMaker Feature Store, and also you learn about how to serve inference predictions, or features for inference predictions with very low latency. How low? It can be as low as up to single digit milliseconds, depending on the payload size. So with that, let me hand it over to my colleague, Mark Roy, for a deeper dive and demo of SageMaker Feature Store. Thanks. Can you take a pic? Hello. How's everyone doing on day four of reInvent? Uh, I think um, there's the clicker. Thank you. Uh, they blessed us with day four in the afternoon, and uh, all of you are here, so you must really, really want to learn about Feature Store. So. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Roy. I'm an ML architect at AWS. Uh, I've spent uh, over the last four years working with SageMaker. I spend most of my waking hours helping companies try to scale ML and find ways to, to build better models faster. And uh, over the last couple of years, I've worked with over 100 companies uh, adopting feature stores. So why is it uh, that so many companies are, are interested? Uh, a couple of big reasons. Uh, one, uh, they're looking at speed and accuracy of transactions, so online transactions. They've got personalization or fraud detection. Uh, they're betting their business on some really important uh, ML models. And then the other uh, key uh, reason is that they're looking to get to that next level of ML maturity. So they move beyond the first few models in production, maybe they're getting into dozens, and they've got a lot of teams, and they want to start to treat features as their own first class entity. So instead of combining all of that with training individual models, decoupling feature engineering from model development and being able to share those across teams, across models, and to monitor and manage and maintain features uh, on their own. So quick show of hands, how many of you already have a feature store in production today? It's a pretty lonely audience out there, a couple of folks, excellent. And uh, did you build that on your own? Keep, raise your hand if you've built it on your own, okay. Almost everybody that said they're in production is a do-it-yourself feature store. Okay, and how many are looking at deploying a feature store in the next 12 months? All right. Cool, even some of the same people that already have one in production. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so you're in the right place. Uh, over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna dive deep on SageMaker Feature Store, show you how it works, uh, and then take you through uh, a demo as well. Everybody ready? Okay, let's dive in. So to start, uh, let me take you through uh, a key question that I get uh, from almost every customer. Is, well, how does this fit in with my data lakes and my data warehouse? Can't I just use that as my feature store? Uh, so here we're showing on the left, you know, common data sources, S3, your data lake, maybe Snowflake, Delta Lake, even uh, a feature store itself. And as a data scientist, uh, typically you're looking at these sources, finding what data you need, and then doing a lot of experimentation, uh, data cleanup, preparing uh, features for your models. So in this new world, not only can you do that, but instead you should first look to the feature store to find out what features already exist. Maybe other teams have already built them, maybe you've built up a library of features that you can reuse in new models. So you can look through the feature catalog, find those, use them, and maybe invent some more. Once you've got the features in a state that you're ready to deploy them and use them in your models or in other models, that's the point where you start to create feature pipelines. Maybe they're batch being deployed, you know, run every evening or every hour, uh, or they're streaming hooked up to, let's say, Kinesis or Kafka, uh, and they're, putting, they're taking raw data, doing feature transformations, and making them available in the feature store. And that can be either in the offline store or the online store or both. 
Once you've got features available in Feature Store, one of the primary use cases, of course, is training models. So if you're a data scientist, you can, you can pull features that already exist, assemble training and validation and testing data sets uh, using a SQL or, or any other mechanism to pull from the offline store. Uh, this is where you could do things like row level time travel as well. Once you've built models, you can use them in a number of different ways. An important way, of course, is uh, online inference. So if, you, if you're one of those cases that really needs uh, low latency online predictions, that's where you'd be pulling the latest feature values from the, the online store, uh, the exact features you need for the exact record identifiers that you need with low latency to make really accurate high-speed predictions. A very common use case, of course, is batch scoring. Uh, so in addition to online, uh, when you're doing batch scoring, let's say you wanted to run your churn model on 25 million customers, you'd pull the latest features for each of those customers across various types of features and then run that against your model uh, in batch. Of course, when you're done with inference, you might want to save those results back into your data lake or into your data warehouse or maybe even back into the feature store itself and this can influence future model uh, training uh, or feed downstream applications uh, or analysis, maybe some BI capabilities. And then lastly, monitoring. So you've got a feature store using those across all kinds of models and teams. You now have the ability to look for feature drift detection, uh, for example. And you can find, do whatever analysis you want uh, across those features, and importantly, lineage. So now you can either look from left to right in this diagram or from right to left to find out dependencies. How did I make that prediction? I used this model. What did that model get built with? These particular features, and where do those features come from? These data sources. And then in the other direction as well, if you're changing features, you might want to find out, well, where's the impact going to be? What models am I going to be impacting? So uh, this gives you uh, kind of the core capabilities and how SageMaker Feature Store gives you a purpose-built way to, to build and manage your, your features over time. OK, the next key concept is materializing features. And these don't happen all at the same uh, cadence. So typically what we see is the most common case is overnight batch features. Here you've got a lot of data sources that maybe are only refreshed daily. Uh, maybe this is a good cadence for uh, looking at aggregate features that look back over longer time periods, like a week or a month or a year. So in a fraud detection use case, for example, we might have a batch job that runs every night. And for each card, credit card, it's looking at what is the total number of transactions on that card and the average purchase amounts uh, over the past month, let's say. So if you're going to do a fraud uh, detection, that's not enough. You need to use those features, but you also need to know what's happening in near real time. So what I'm showing here is hooking up to Kafka on the stream of transactions and doing aggregations that cover the last 10 minutes. So now I've got how often is this card being used recently? How often was it used historically? And I can compare those, and that can be a signal into a, an online fraud model. So what happens is the fraud model is able to pull whatever features it needs across various feature groups in near real time at very low latency at high throughput. Also. As these features get updated, you can automatically keep the history of those features in the offline store. So that can be used for future retraining or for training new models as well. Uh, so Romy mentions this uh, earlier, feature consistency uh, with the online and the offline store. So a, a common question I get is, how is the offline store really different from the online store? Sometimes 
uh, somebody new to a feature store doesn't quite get um, the main difference. So this example hopefully will, will cement the, uh, the concepts home here. So let's say we've got customer features. We're going to put in a feature record for each of three different customers, time T1, T2, T3. And then at time T4 and T5, I'm going to put in a new record for that same customer, customer one. So let's look at the state of the online store and the offline store after this set of calls. In the online store, I can use my fancy laser pointer here. Well, maybe I can't. <laughs> uh, OK. You can see uh, the customer ID 1 in the online store, it's showing 0 0.5 as the latest feature value. And it was from time T5. Every feature has an event time. Uh, OK, so the online store has the latest values, and they're available uh, immediately. The offline store, in contrast here, has the full history. So you can see for customer ID 1, you can see where it was at time T1 and T4 and T5. So why is that interesting? Uh, the main reason is that you really need some different implementations in order to meet the differing requirements. If you want high-speed lookups, You've got DynamoDB in the back of the online store to get single uh, or, or small sets of records at a time. The offline store is more optimized for bulk retrieval for batch scoring, as well as time travel for doing training data sets. OK, we talked about reuse across teams and across models. Well, you're probably not going to be able to reuse features if you don't know what features exist, right? So let's talk about how does that happen. So what Feature Store offers uh, is a built-in feature catalog. So when you define new features, uh, you, you categorize them as features and, and within feature groups, and you get to provide names and descriptions and whatever metadata you'd like uh, on all of them. Once it's in that feature catalog, you can use SageMaker Studio to quickly search uh, across your full repository of features that's growing over time and find those and, and figure out what, what you want to reuse versus starting from scratch. Uh, and if your company is big enough where you've already got your own ML portal, let's say, you could plug this in using the search API as well. You don't have to use uh, Studio to, to find features. OK, I talked about metadata. Let's uh, take a look at what, how that uh, works. So in this example, I've got a pair of feature groups, uh, some features related to loans, and some other features related to customers. Uh, so I've got to name them. I can define their data types and so forth. Uh, but in addition, you get to define uh, the description for the feature group and define whatever metadata you'd like. Here we're, we're tagging. Uh, authors, uh, the, the team that built it, maybe the stage of development that it's at, uh, and so forth. In addition, at the feature, individual feature level, you can do the same thing. Whatever metadata tags you'd like to put in there, uh, here we're adding a sensitivity tag. So you can define some features uh, have a higher sensitivity than others, and maybe you manage security that way. So again, that's all up to you. And this will drive uh, things like how well you can search and, and discover features, as well as additional man, uh, manage management that you want to do of features uh, over time. OK, let's dive into uh, ingestion. How do you get features into the feature store? Well, at the very lowest level, there is a put record API, very straightforward. Identify the feature group name, provide a record identifier, the event time, which you get to control, and then a set of, a set of name value pairs. Uh, so which uh, features are, are you uh, adding? In addition, so that's one record at a time. Uh, when you're needing to ingest you know, hundreds or millions or tens or hundreds of millions of, of records, you're typically wanting to do that in bulk. So there's a Python SDK that will take a 
pandas data frame and let you ingest that whole thing uh, at once. Uh, or if you're using a Spark environment, you can take a Spark data frame and ingest that in its entirety as well. OK, so that's kind of the core APIs for getting uh, features in. Let's look at how you automate feature pipelines. Right? So this is code if, let's say, you were in a notebook uh, experimenting, just putting some features uh, on your own. This is what you would use. But you'd also want to automate that to deploy these in your production environments. So back to our original picture, we've got your data sources on the left, feature store on the right. What are the approaches that we see for customers uh, deploying feature pipelines? SageMaker gives you the flexibility to pick and choose to fit with your skill sets and your existing ecosystem uh, to drive these decisions. So one of, the, one of the common approaches that we see is that customers love Spark, right? So they want to use PySpark, Spark SQL. Uh, so we've got the Spark connector that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then you could do that from a notebook or an EMR environment. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Studio recently, SageMaker Studio, recently integrated uh, EMR environments directly into that environment. Uh, and also even Glue interactive sessions, so you can get kind of a serverless flavor of Spark uh, immediately in your notebook. Uh, you could um, even schedule those directly from Studio as well. Uh, so a lot of different possibilities uh, for customers that want to use Spark for automation. Uh, another flavor that we see commonly is that uh, customers are trying to move into more of a low code feature development. So here's you're trying to scale out, maybe get more data science teams building more models more quickly. They could use something like SageMaker Data Wrangler, where you can easily connect to data sources, use off-the-shelf transformations, put them together in a, an overall flow, and then save and manage that feature transformation flow as a, a unit, and then directly connect to Feature Store from Data Wrangler and schedule that as an ongoing uh, job. The third common approach is uh, customers that like pure Python and pandas. Uh, we've got options here where you could use the Python SDK to ingest those data frames. And a common approach here is to use SageMaker processing jobs where you can scale horizontally and vertically and then just use very simple scripts here to uh, ingest a, a large amount of features on a recurring basis. Great. Uh, let's look at how you get data out of the feature store. So when we talk about the offline store, uh, we're, we're basically, as Romy mentioned, we're talking about an S3 bucket in your account. Uh, and we're storing partitioned Parquet files out there. Uh, but you don't really have to worry about that. What we do is we offer a way to automatically make these available as tables uh, in a glue catalog. Uh, we're coming up with other formats as well, but basically you can just see your feature groups uh, as tables and then use SQL uh, to make queries. So here I'm saying select a various set of features, maybe a label uh, from uh, a feature group, or you could join across feature groups, uh, generate your training data sets and use them uh, to build your models. Same thing for batch scoring. You can use the offline store. Uh, use Athena APIs or use the Athena console interactively to do uh, SQL queries to access the offline store. Now, importantly, uh, this is where row-level time travel will happen. So if you've got a long history of all of these features over time, you've got a set of events that you're trying to train against, you need to make sure you get the accurate set of features and that would be done using uh, a SQL interface or some helper libraries as well. So that's getting data out of the offline store. What about the online store? So here we've got some very simple APIs that work with low latency and high scale, high throughput. So get record, uh, you give it the feature group that you're looking at, 
exactly which, uh, which a record identifier you want, and you either get back the whole set of features for that record, or you can pick a subset. You might have a very large feature group with 2,000 features in it, but your model might only need 10 of them. You can say, I want these 10 features. Now, the opposite case is true. You might have five different feature groups that have features that are needed for one prediction. You can get up to 100 different records at once with a single call. Uh, in this example, uh, from the customer feature group, I'm um, getting three different customers and two different features for each of those. And then I'm also pulling records from the product feature group, uh, two different products and two different features there. So with one call, I can get back all of those and then pass those on to make a model prediction. So again, these operate at low latency and high throughput for those kinds of applications that really demand uh, you know, high speed uh, predictions. Okay, the last thing before we turn over to a quick demo uh, is a few inference patterns. So I just showed you APIs for doing feature lookups. How are those used in practice? So the simplest way to use it, you've got an application, maybe it's a website, a mobile app, needs to make a prediction, needs to do it in a hurry. <laughs> so they know uh, what the model needs, so they go to the online feature store, call get record or bats get record, take those features, pass them to the model endpoint to make a prediction. Pretty simple, right? Uh, it works quite well. Uh, so the benefit is the simplicity. The drawback here is that your application knows exactly what the model needs. So what happens when the model changes and adds 10 more features? Well, the application needs to change. So a way to uh, improve this is Pattern number two. So here we've got endpoint-based feature lookup. So same sort of scenario here. We've got the application, the endpoint, and the feature store. But in this case, the application just says, here's the customer ID that I want to make this prediction on. In the inference endpoint, you know exactly what the model needs. So you go look those up, uh, get the features that you need, make the prediction, pass them back to the application. So the end result is the same, but now you can feel free to evolve the model over time as you see fit. All the applications are, are insulated from those changes. And then pattern number three is just a slight variation of that. Uh, and here we're just using SageMaker inference pipelines. So making the code a little bit more modular, you break it up into separate containers that are chained together. The first container is doing the feature retrieval. The second container is actually doing the model prediction. And maybe you've got a third container doing some post-processing uh, and, and so forth. Okay, uh, so I've got a choice here. We can either do 25 more slides or we could do a demo. Show of hands. Slides, okay, no. Please hold the questions till the end, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take them. Okay, now I've got to press the right button, and uh, we'll switch to the demo. Fingers crossed. Oh my gosh, it worked. Okay, so uh, here's the scenario. So I'll, I'll play the role of a data scientist here, and I work for a, an app company that's building apps for airlines. And uh, my latest project is to predict flight delays. So I've been working on some with flight delay data, making some features. I've got aggregate features like how many delays for each flight in the past seven days, things like that. Uh, but then I've heard that some other team in the company has been working on some weather features and they've started to make those available. So I wanna figure out if that's gonna help me uh, with my model. So what I'll show you is how we can discover those features, uh, how we can do time travel and train a model and make some batch predictions, and then we'll actually show you how you can use that for online predictions as well. Maybe we're gonna use them uh, from a mobile app, for example. So here I'm in SageMaker Studio. Uh, there's this new SageMaker Home that you, 
The user interface has been simplified a little bit, so we can look under this data uh, category, and I find Feature Store. So I bring up Feature Store. I've got a Feature Catalog, uh, Feature Group Catalog, and I'm interested in kind of wind speed and maybe precipitation, snowfall. So let me just look for uh, snow. Looks like I found some features there. Wind, I've got some more. Let's take, it, take a look at the descriptions here. And if my mouse would work, here we go. So I've got a bunch of different wind features that seem like they might, might be helpful. So I can click on the feature group. And yeah, here's a feature group with uh, a dozen or so different uh, weather features that, that look pretty good. It would probably take me a couple of weeks to figure out where that data lives and figure out these features on my own, get them in the right units, and remove outliers, all the cleanup. Instead, somebody's already done that work, and uh, it looks like they're going to be maintaining it over time as well. So I think I should take advantage of this. I can look at the detail of this feature group. Uh, I've got the ARN here. I've got some offline storage information. Oh, great. I can see where it lives in S3. Uh, and there's a, uh, a database out there. So it exists as a table within that database. Here's the table name. Uh, and it's actually being used in the online store as well. So some feature groups might be online store or offline store or both. It looks like this one is, is both. Uh, there's even some sample queries here. So you could cut and paste some of these queries and use them directly in Athena or whatever your favorite query engine is. So here's one for just looking at some of the data, doing time travel, removing uh, old, uh, deleted records, uh, removing duplicates if there are any, and so forth. So what I'll do then is come back to the notebook and uh, show you a little bit of code here. So here I'm using a, a helper function um, that will uh, make it easy to do some of the queries. So for example, I'm uh, doing a sample of five records from this uh, weather feature group. So here I can see I've got all of those features available. Uh, let's see, um, minimum winds, wind speed. Uh, I've got wind uh, in miles per hour. I've got average temperatures, precipitation, and so forth. Notice that all the features have uh, event times, and they even have write times, API invocation times and a flag as to whether they've uh, been deleted. Uh, OK, so let's, uh, let's look at what's next. So I can do the same thing with the flight delay data, uh, the features that I was working on myself, uh, whereas the weather features were ones that I'm hoping to now take advantage of. So I mentioned time travel. Let's take a look at that uh, briefly here. Uh, OK, great. So, this picture is trying to simplify it a bit to give you a feel for what I mean when I talk about real level time travel. On the left, you've got just a representation of history of features for weather features and for flight features, right? So uh, each has record identifier, so Boston Logan Airport, uh, Orlando Airport, uh, an event time, and uh, a sample feature value uh, for wind, for example. And for each flight, I've got similarly an event time and then an aggregate feature that I created uh, counting up the, the flight delays over the last seven days uh, historically. So I've got that in the offline store. And then I've got a set of training events that I want to use to drive creation of a training data set. So there I've got, most importantly, a set of event times as to when those events happened and then identifiers for the airport and the flight. And here I've got a label as well. Uh, and then I have a list of features that I want to grab. And I've, if I call roll level time travel, magic happens and it does all the right joins. I don't have to know all the messy SQL uh, to make that happen. And then I can do model training. So here's some code where I'm just looking up the set of events that I want to train with. Uh, so I've got 400,000 rows here and append as data frame. Uh, and then I've got a, a helper function here to just get those features. This is basically where real-level time travel is happening. I've got all the events that I want to pull. 
uh, and then I've got a list of the features that I'm using, and uh, voila, it took the events. So see, I can still have I still have 400,000 rows, but now it's filled in all of the accurate feature values based on the event times uh, across multiple different feature groups. So here I've got no feature leakage where I'm using data that I never would have known about, and I'm also uh, making sure that I don't have to worry about all the messy SQL involved to, to make that happen. So now I've just got the standard fare here of uh, splitting into a train, uh, training and testing data sets, building an X XGBoost classifier here in the notebook just as an example, and then making uh, a prediction on the test data set showing some uh, accuracy. So uh, what about if we're doing uh, batch scoring? So similar process here. Um, in this case, I'm not looking at the history of feature values. I want the very latest feature values because I want to predict uh, a set of flights that are about to happen. So I gather up uh, the set of flights that are about to happen, and then I get the latest features for each of those flights using the airport ID and the flight ID. So here I'm gathering up those flights. Here I've got a few thousand flights. Then I'm pulling those latest features. And so I get those again into a, a data set, 3,000 rows of flights, all of the latest features, not the historical features. Uh, and then I can just use those uh, to run predictions uh, against that uh, set of features. So you can see some of the flights were uh, predicted to uh, be delayed and others weren't. Okay, so uh, I talked about uh, online store as well. So let's pretend that we're moving beyond batch scoring once a night on the flights for tomorrow. Uh, and now we want to give users a, a mobile application and let them predict, um, you know, see where their, their flight's going to be delayed. So how would we do that? Um, I've written a little handy function here, uh, predict delay given a flight ID. It takes the uh, flight ID, pulls out the airport, uh, gets the latest feature values, uh, and then calls the uh, prediction on that model. So the, the key here is this lookup where we're looking up at the, from the online store with low latency and making a prediction. So if we pass in this flight from Boston to DC, it's not going to be delayed. The one from Orlando to Houston is going to be delayed, and maybe you can try it out tonight to, to make sure you're going to be on time tomorrow. Uh, and then lastly, uh, here I've got an example where I just said, hey, that seemed pretty fast. Um, how fast does the online store work? Uh, Romy mentioned single digit latency. So I just looped through 1,000 times here, grabbing a set of records. And in this case, it was average was about six milliseconds, and P95 was, was nine. So with that, we are going to, am I going the wrong direction? Yes, I am. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Sergey uh, to talk about how Zolando is using SageMaker Feature Store. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sergey Polipchuk. I am principal software engineer at Zolando Payments. And today, I want to share with you our recent experience integrating with SageMaker Feature Store. Here, we have disclaimer slide, and let's move to the introduction. Zalando is the leading European online platform for fashion and lifestyle. It was founded in Berlin in 2008. Now, we are bringing fashion to almost 50 million active customers across 25 European markets, offering clothing, footwear, beauty, and accessories. As Europe's most fashionable tech company, we work hard to bring digital solutions for every step of the fashion journey. Our vision is to be the starting point for fashion and sustainable platform with the net positive impact for people and the planet. For example, oops, uh, in payments, we can offer more than 20 payment methods 
across 25 European countries in their local currency. We strive to make payment experience as simple as possible. At the same time, we try to protect our company from losses due to non-payments. Let's take a look for usual order flow. Our customer browsed the catalog, big items they like, add to the cart. Eventually, they will go to check out, place the order. Our fulfillment centers will pack the order and then ship to customer. We, as payments, are involved during the checkout, where we provide the most convenient payment methods for our customers. And after the order was placed, we process the transaction and do additional check to make sure we can accept the order. In those two points, we have a really rely of a decision on machine learning. A few years ago, when we started to build our machine learning products, there were no readily available platforms. So we invested into building our own framework for training and inference. The big chunk of the improvements to our machine learning model came from the feature engineering. In this context, we differentiate two classes of features. One, which need to change their values close to real time, because we need to react fast on the fraud attempts and prevent them. Another class of features allow us to recalculate their values on some schedule, for example, every hour or every day. Those features we name batch computed features, and today I will focus on our work with batch computed features. So in our legacy framework, batch computed features were embedded in memory. So every request for inference got the features from memory storage, then passed to the preprocessor, and then uh, to the model. That gave us benefits of high availability and close to zero latency. But this in-memory serving came with very high price. Any new feature was slowing down our startup time of our inference service and incre was increasing memory demand. <laughs> this had led to a situation where our teams were very careful and conservative when it comes to feature engineering and adding new features to the, uh, our system. Second problem was about absence of the feature catalog. Our teams are working in very similar problem spaces, and oftentimes they were coming up with the similar features, but slightly different feature uh, implementation. <laughs> this has led to double work on the experiments, implementing the feature calculation, feature pipelines. Also, it created additional burden on our inference uh, service, where two different features with different, slightly different implementation, but very similar by the concept, required memory and, again, slowed the startup. Even though this framework worked for us for years well, but mentioned, problem, <coughs> mentioned problems were slowing us down and time to market for feature-related improvements were growing rapidly. So at the beginning of this year, we decided to look around and find better solution for feature, batch feature serving. First of all, we brainstormed a list of the requirement for our replacement. And on top of it, we decided that it should be a managed solution where feature serving and any operational problems is taken uh, by a team of experts, and we as payments can focus on our core business. The source of features will be used for live purchase inference or evaluation. So it should be very fast, scalable, and reliable. The solution should have searchable feature catalog. We want our give ability to our teams benefit from work of each other and do not repeat uh, same experiments. The features should be available through the whole department. Addition of new features should be as easy as possible. And ideally, this new source for features should be 
also source as the, for the training data. After some research, SageMaker Feature Store became the primary candi candidate to evaluate. So for the evaluation, we took the responsibility of serving batch computed features from our legacy inference service and moved that uh, serving part to the feature store. We tried to keep the infrastructure around same as it was to not disrupt the team work as much as possible. So let's take a look how we ingest features. Our batch computed features are computed in scheduled notebook, the notebook uh, writes feature values to the, feature, to the S3, a small service listens to the S3 notifications through the SQS, reads data, recognize the feature group and feature name, and then consult with the feature store and see if that feature group already there or not. If not, it will just create the feature group and then push data there. This approach allowed us to give the ability to our data scientists introduce new feature group and feature as simple as just creating the processing notebook and output data to the S3. Everything else is taken and automatically done. On the read part, we also hide the, the internal uh, structure of the feature store from our consuming services. And API facade service reads a metadata, the tags, and uh, all the information from the feature store, builds internal registry, and then from the incoming request, it match the metadata from feature store with incoming request, builds batch get features, and then loads feature from the feature store and serves to the consuming services. The system is already up and running and integrated in our live flows. It fulfills all our initial requirements. Among those, the most important was performance. Recently, the system went through the series of slow tests and successfully went through the Cyber Week and sales events. And here I want to share with you uh, a snapshot from our monitoring. On the top graph, there is a invocation count and a sudden traffic bars during sales event. The, the peak goes more than 10 times from the baseline. On the lower graph, you can see the P99 batch get request latency from the feature store. And the times uh, is, is exactly the same. And latency doesn't change at all during the, the sudden uh, traffic bars. That, that's impressive. Also, I want to mention here that Feature Store is AZ fault tolerant by default, and we didn't need to spend any time implementing uh, some resilience patterns. During the work on the project, we observed some limitations. For example, in very early stages, there were no easy way to fetch request error or throttle request counts from the CloudWatch but that was addressed by Feature Store team very fast. Also, during this year, Switch improved greatly. For us, at this point, this really small integration with the Feature Store brought a big improvement. Our teams can add new features without thinking of the operational problems. So they just add an experiment without knowledge how it works and without this fear to break our inference uh, pipeline. We mitigated burning problem of the inference pipeline where we had a high memory consumption, very slow startup times. And very importantly, our teams now can search of the feature of each other and benefit from those work. They can reuse features and access the feature store from any point of our department. And that is just the start of our work with SageMaker Feature Store. As the next step, we want to improve our integration. We want to add much more features to the online feature store. We will start trial for the offline feature store as the source for our training pipelines. 
And eventually, we want to deprecate and completely remove our legacy framework and switch our training and inference to such microproducts. With that, I want to thank our engineering teams, Team NextGen, Team Turing, Team Gatekeepers, which worked hard during this year to make this happen. And of course, I want to thank SageMaker team for their great product, their patience and support during the project. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Sergey. Great, uh, great presentation there. Uh, awesome example of uh, SageMaker in action. Uh, let me just share with you a couple of quick resources before we wrap up. Uh, one that uh, uh, gets a lot of visibility out there to help customers that are really trying to evaluate and get started with SageMaker. Uh, it's called our end-to-end -end feature store workshop. It takes you through a lot of what I described today uh, with sample code. You can just use the GitHub repo, bring that down into your own account, and run through all of these things and get a feel for how you can uh, integrate uh, in your own environment. Uh, there's also... Uh, a dozen or so uh, blog posts out there, and you'll get a PDF with all of this in there with the links. Um, um, of course, taking a picture of those links won't get you there, but you've at least got some uh, context there to, to do Google search on our AWS blog uh, site. Uh, and then similarly, there's some links to documentation, but you can, you can find those pretty quickly yourself as well. Uh, so today, our session, we, we learned, uh, hopefully you learned uh, a lot about SageMaker Feature Store, how that provides a fully managed environment. Uh, so you don't have to build your own feature store, come up with that infrastructure and manage it on your own. Uh, you can easily define and create features uh, and immediately have a low latency online store that's synchronized with an append-only offline store to support training and inference uh, in a robust way. So thank you very much for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.